Dr. Nildip? Can you hear me, Dr. Nildip? Yes, sir. Uh, I can hear you, sir. I'm ready, sir. Uh, okay, fine. Good morning. Uh, Good morning today sir. we are having another seminar on uh, basic subjects because these are all important uh, topics for uh, theory examination in DAB exam. So you will have uh, maybe a short note type question on these uh, topics. So they are all uh, basic uh, sciences in uh, surgery. So today we will have a um, seminar on these subjects and uh, there are three speakers, Dr. Nildeep Sina from uh, PLS Hospital, first year junior resident. Dr. Sakrajit is first year <laughs> junior resident at Howrah District Hospital. And Dr. Anindra is a junior resident first year at Ruby General Hospital. So we studied the first topic, uh, preoperative care and optimization. It's a very important topic. And I just, uh, request Dr. Nildeep to share his screen and start. Dr. Das will be joining. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, take just a few seconds. Sir, uh, am I audible and visible, sir? Uh, hello, sir. Am I visible, sir? Hello. Uh, Dr. Nildeep, you are audible, but your slides are not visible. Yes. Yeah, now they are visible. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Please start. Uh, good morning to all the teachers and uh, all my seniors. I am Dr. Nildeep Sinha, junior resident first year junior resident from PLS hospital. Today I would be uh, presenting the topic of preoperative care and optimization, which itself uh, is a very important topic as clearly mentioned by uh, Also, uh, I tried to uh, cover the whole topic through several slides. I should, I, I would like to mention that it may seem some of the slides are a bit, uh, a bit of bulky to incorporate some of the informations. I would like to, uh, but I have tried to cover the whole topic as extensive as possible. So I am starting with the topic. Uh, so a surgery, whether it's an elective or an emergency one, preoperative assessment is of paramount importance to stratify the risk associated with the surgery and to determine the feasibility, choosing the exact surgical procedure, like the procedure itself, uh, and also timely optimization to minimize the perioperative morbidity and mortality. The assessment is a thorough uh, systematic evaluation uh, using various tools to determine patient's clinical background and pre-existing conditions. As you all know, when a patient arrives to us, whether it's, sorry, 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 whether it's a uh, emergency setup, emergency department, or in our OPDs, especially in the emergencies, there may not be uh, investigations uh, or preoperative uh, aspects are available to us. So it's an important uh, aspect to determine and to plan the treatment itself. So the first the heading of the whole topic would be the patient's assessment, and I would uh, try with the history. So that's first, the philosophy of the whole uh, history should be taken, focusing on a patient's hopes and expectations. That is, we should listen from the patient uh, through open questions and should listen to them what their exact issue is on the first visit. Then on specific questions, 
aimed at clarifying the diagnosis and severity of the symptoms. Those should be like close patients. A set of fixed, now to uh, narrow the things, a set of fixed questions are needed to determine the fitness for the surgery. Now the principles, in uh, easy words, uh, Four, it can be as uh, clearly uh, written on sentence textbooks that the principle of the history taking should be has uh, four main top uh, points, which are first listen what is the problem, which is which is the open question, then is to clarify what the patients said and what the patient expect. That is through the closed questions. Now we have to narrow the informations uh, which we have gathered through through this. Uh, aforementioned processes and uh, should have our own differential diagnosis and also we should inquire about the comorbidities or the pre-existing conditions of the patients. Now in the next slide I have mentioned a uh, few uh, points regarding system-wise points I would will be precise uh, so that Without other than these um, issues, there can be other issues as well. But uh, mostly, these are at least we should take history on these points uh, system-wise. Like as far as the cardiovascular system is concerned, ischemic heart diseases, angina, myocardial infarction, hypertension, heart failure. These are the points we usually try to inquire in our regular surgical practice and these are of paramount info importance. So I have through this, it's a bulky slide, I must say, but I have tried to mention most of the points uh, in this slide. Uh, system wise, which are the at least basic things we should inquire while uh, in the first encounter with the patient. So moving to the next part of the discussion. After we are aware of the basic information from the patient itself, we would go for the general examination. So general examination includes, first we would look, look for pallor, like anemia, jaundice, cyanosis, nutritional status of the patient is built. Also other in informations like any uh, clubbing, or so infection that as mentioned in the slide <clears throat> general examination also includes some basic systemic aspects as well like uh, as far as cardiovascular system is concerned pulse uh, and as we all know in the pulse we'll look for the rate rhythm uh, any any abnormal pulses also ectopic beats and uh, special pulses like water hammer pulses and all as we all know and also for the blood pressure, heart sounds, brui, uh, peripheral edema. In the respiratory system, we go look for the respiratory rate, respiratory effort, chest expansion, percussion note, breath sounds. Like you, in usual cases, whether it's a adventitious, is there any adventitious breath sounds or, or it's the vesicular breath sound? We regularly look for it. And also very important is the oxygen saturation which we look well in the preoperative also perioperative setup as well so in gastrointestinal uh, first we will look for all, although it's not mentioned we would look for the skin any pigmentation any scar uh, any uh, like uh, also the scars ulcerations abdominal masses uh, any visible herniation like any swelling ascites and also like uh, we should all, all obviously look for genitalia as well and bowel sounds. In neurological, we would look for the cognitive functions, conscious level while examining the patient and basic muscle power, power, tone and reflexes as well. Now, as far as the airway assessment is concerned, I have discussed it later in a uh, like uh, described way. So we would look uh, further with the examination specific to the surgery. So now with the basic uh, clinical uh, query and examination, we are now very specific to uh, proceed with the uh, uh, 
queries regarding sp the specific part of the surgery, like itself the top on the topic. So it's uh, to assess the clinical findings, site, site specific imaging or investigation findings related to the pathology for which the surgery is proposed should be noted. Now, suitability of the patient for the proposed surgical option and vice versa should also be assessed. I have mentioned the basic uh, like philosophy of the examination proper. So, I am proceeding with the routine preoperative. I will like explain every point which I mentioned. So, now with the routine preoperative investigations, uh, we, which we um, of, definitely do for a, a surgical patient, which are mostly like the complete blood count, we look for the hemoglobin level, we look for the total count, we look for the platelet, um, back cell volume, etc. And electrolytes like sodium in calcium in particular cases, uh, biochemical parameters like creatinine, urea, fasting blood sugar in an emergency setup, we, should, we may have to look for a RBS in a diabetic patient, whether the glycemic control was achieved since past three months, which is reflected by uh, glycosylated hemoglobin. We should also look for weight and also TSH as a screening because in many patients, especially uh, middle-aged and female patients, we encounter as uh, like, uh, you know, previously undiagnosed uh, thyroid patient, we, on the first uh, go, we like, with TSH, we can screen for the patient whether the patient is uh, hypothyroid, is going, having hypothyroidism or, or not, as it has got a paramount import, um, importance in awakening the patient, although that is mostly taken care of by the anesthetist. Uh, but as a surgeon, we should also be careful on that as well. So now the uh, liver function tests, uh, chest X-ray, these are routine tests and clotting screen where we look for uh, prothrombin time, IPTT and INR uh, mostly, uh, and also ECG and EDN analysis. So as far as ECO is concerned in, in, in modern practice, we go for ECO in the cardiovascular portion, which I have mentioned later, I will be discussing further. Now, space after our basic preoperative investigations are over, we should look for specific complications and its managements. Like I have given a chart, preoperative management of patients with systemic disease. <clears throat> so in through like to uh, look for the specific complications, these things we should be looking for the capacity of the patient baseline, organ function capacity should be assessed, optimization like any medication, lifestyle changes, Specialist refer will improve the organ capacity. Like an example, if a patient had a history of uh, acute myocardial infarction in the past, uh, he or she may have a history of uh, like chest pain, shortness of breath, and uh, syncope may or may not be associated with that. So if we have a history, we should like uh, go for further examinations like a echocardiography. We should take a multidisciplinary approach uh, through which it's not, it, it's clearly mentioned, it's not for the, uh, just, just for the clearance from the cardiologist or any other disciplines, it's to stratify whether the patient can be, uh, uh, patient can go for the surgery, also whether uh, the uh, operations or the surgery is more beneficial than the risk uh, the surgery is providing. So that certification is very important and that's, that can be done through investigations and also opinions and advices from the, our fellow uh, colleagues, in this case, cardiologist. So now the alternative, uh, see if, like for a patient we have, who has recently went through a, uh, let's say, um, recanalization for a uh, coronary artery disease. So in that case, uh, if, if he's uh, like uh, uh, stent was a uh, bare metal stent was introduced. I'm just giving an example. So if he, if he needs a surgery and which isn't an uh, emergency one, we may have to delay the surgery by six to 12 months. So these are the things like, uh, or also like in a uh, patient, uh, 
if we have an option for a laparoscopic procedure that is a minimal invasive one so we can uh, go for, a, for that procedure in a patient of um, bleeding disorder so that um, uh, the chances of bleeding can be minimized so this is what it is like minimally impacting procedure like determining the exact procedure what should be the appropriate one for the patient itself so and also the planning the post operative care like if we having a prolonged surgery the post operative uh, dvt profile access so these are like in in a patients who has a previous history of uh, pulmonary thromboembolism so in this scenarios we have to be very cautious and through thorough Uh, uh like evaluations we should plan the post operative care as well before and so that uh and uh, like uh, um, unwanted events can be avoided uh, avoided in a surgical setup so now the last is the theater preparation like the timing the uh, briefing to the team and any like any energy device any special in a case of like past Uh, operative history we are expecting adhesion so we are like um, um, uh, preparing ligature or thunder i am just giving an example like any any um, uh, energy devices which may be required for the surgery itself so going uh, to the specific complications i would start <coughs> <coughs> sorry extremely sorry uh, with the cardiovascular disease so i will come to the rcr right? so one of the most commonly said tools to stratify the cardiovascular risk is the rcri globally rcri and also the acs american uh, college of surgeons ns qip calculator which is commonly used there are certain parameters but i have mentioned rcri as it's a bit crisp and also a uh, like brief one uh, uh, ncqip risk calculator is a bulky uh, whole uh, chart we or i won't be mentioning so um, uh, just briefing the whole thing so it's uh, rci one of the most commonly cited tool is rci right uh, that's uh, revised cardi cardiac risk index so uh, rci has moderate discriminatory power between patients at a low versus high risk for cardiac complications its uh, primary advantage is uh, obviously the ease of implementation and relatively objective criteria which is very important in clinical practice because it's not possible all the time for look for 20 parameters uh, to stratify a cardiac risk so it's a bit lucid and crisp uh, to uh, stratify but also as it's mentioned that it, its discriminatory power is moderate in moderation um, but also uh, provides us with an idea to uh, stratify the exact risk also it is recommended by the acc and american heart association as well so <clears throat> alternative to the rcri is also the nsqip scoring now an important component of this assessment is an estimation of patient's functional capacity now there is a uh, term called metabolic equivalent of tasks so cardiological uh, evaluation consists of several tasks and we through questionnaires or thorough questioning we try to understand the activities of the patients which they are able to perform in a regular day to day life so through different tools we try to uh, uh, query from the patient whether they are able to perform regular day to day activity and also some active special activities to determine the patient's clinically obviously the clinically the condition of the patient's heart now uh, acc and ach guidelines recommend that patients with met more than 4 the scoring um, uh, metabolic equivalent task scoring more than 4 without symptoms of cardiac disease <coughs> can be proceeded for with elective or urgent operation now the problem arises <coughs> uh when no, no in, at, at low risk operation these things are not that important like uh, we can go for it regardless of the clinical risk factors even with functional capacities more than less than 4 minutes uh it's a low risk cardiac complication 
procedure and does not require for the testing but as i mentioned previously uh, if a patient went through a, a stenting for any pre existing coronary artery disease the risk of stent thrombosis with consequences of mi and death is reduced if elective surgery is delayed until after dual and antiplatelet therapy is stopped about 6 weeks after bare metal stent and 12 months after the drug eluting stent in insertion uh, nildeep nildeep uh, yes. we have to wind up we wind up in 5 minutes uh, uh, okay sir i just on the salient points so that you can okay. finish up in next 5 minutes okay okay sir so i'm just mentioning the basic uh, uh, yeah, yeah. We... yes sir okay, okay. so the elective surgery blood pressure should be controlled near 160 and 90 and anti hypertensive should not be a new and anti hypertensive uh, hypertensive should not be introduced um, so if you if we introduce we should uh, at wait at least 2 weeks for the optimization now echocardio as, as i mentioned echocardiography nowadays is routinely performed for the uh, to uh, assess the left ventricular ejection fraction also it is very important in a patient with past history of heart failure as well now <clears throat> i am not like uh, describing further in the cardiovascular section and moving with anemia it's a very important thing now very brief brief yeah so uh, our target hemoglobin level is at least 8 g per dl and uh, if the patient is having uh, less than 8 g we should go for a preoperative blood transfusion also uh, in some uh, particular cases like uh, we can go for uh, uh, iron iron and vitamin supplementations but obviously that in that case is the hemoglobin should be more than 8 now i am mentioning just the points in respiratory diseases four important points are very important to like to, uh, as far the history is concerned smoking uh, um, uh, the history of smoking and uh, should it be advised we advise uh, should be advising that uh, smoking should be stopped at least two weeks prior to the procedure now asthma like the uh, any medication whether they they are um, uh, uh, prescribed in previous um, setup and all we should uh, acquire that any any precipitating factor of the asthma and also copd and infection any previous past infections uh, encountered by the patient now gastrointestinal um, in in gastrointestinal part patient should be advised it is very important we are uh, um, uh, definitely will ask the patient to be kneel per mouth within 6 hours for the um, solids and clear fluids within 2 hours before the anesthetic and we during this procedure if the uh, like the operation is being delayed we should go for the iv fluids which i am not elaborating much also to avoid the regurgitation we usually use the uh, proton pump inhibitors or h2 inhibitors liver disease has complications like varices and hypoalbuminemia in um, abdominal otis where uh, anastomosis is done hypoalbuminemia has got some very important things and also the coagulation uh, is also affected by the liver disease itself now the gen genital urinary diseases is, uh, as concern appropriate measures should be taken to treat acidosis hypercalcemia and also hypercalcemia greater than 6 uh, millimole per liter and in case of aki uh so, so if this is a surgical emergency simultaneous in intervention by medical and um, nephrologist assistance should be taken and active upi we usually uh, avoid the operation but uh, if if it's emergency it can be done with a uh, antibiotic coverage now coagulation disorder i am just mentioning few basic things that like uh, if a patient is on warfarin and in an arterial thrombosis history <coughs> we should be stopping it and should be replacing it with heparin and the time margins are very important that are uh, should be stopped 5 days before elective surgery and unfractionated heparin should be stopped 4 to 6 hours before the surgery while low molecular uh, weight heparin like enoxaparin should be stopped at least 24 hours before surgery endocrine and uh, metabolic disorders uh, any case in case of diabetes like as i mentioned hb1c should be checked and also patient patients uh, capillary blood glucose should be take, checked every 2 hours and uh, uh, patients are usually advised not to take their diabetic medications uh, on that day uh, of surgery uh, and if any requirement of hyperglycemia then we we, we usually co uh, control it with uh, usually uh, through uh, insulin therapy now neurological and psychiatric disorders Uh, as i mentioned as the aspects of aspirin and we should <coughs> stop 7 <coughs> days 
before and aspirin and in case of clopidogrel it's 10 days and anticonvulsant uh, and anti parkinson medications are usually uh, continued pre perioperatively to help the early mobilization of the patient and lithium as we know it's uh, uh, it, it requires therapeutic drug monitoring so lithium toxicity we should look, look for the blood lithium level before the surgery itself uh, and uh, tcn mau inhibitors uh, should be informed to the anesthetic uh, <clears throat> now the other other aspects like the musculoskeletal system all with all man airway assessment uh, malampathy test which is recently modif modified to the samson and young malampathy uh, scale which is usually checked by the anesthetist but we should also be aware of the things now risk assessment uh, which we common in practice regularly as which a simple scale we use is the american society of anesthesiologists physical status is saps now it's already written i am not just uh, describing further <coughs> so now the most commonly used uh, risk factor as i mentioned earlier is the NSQIP surgical risk calculator, which has 13 specific or composite outcomes within 30 days of surgery. And the last and not the least is the informed consent and valid consent implies that it is given a voluntary by a competent and informed person which is not under any stress or duress in emergency situations or in an unconscious patient consent may not be obtained and the procedure carried out in the best interest, interest of the patient. The comprehensive consent uh, uh, like consists of following things, uh, which is very beautifully mentioned in this slide. So it's also of paramount importance nowadays, both for the patient's well-being as well as the medical legal aspects as well. And now last is the arranging the theater list, any special instruments, side side timing of the operation. We usually know. That's all. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Nildi, we have presented very well and the uh, whole part of this pre-op optimization is discussed. But keep in mind that uh, there are two basic components. You have mentioned that the first thing is assessment of the patient for the underlying diagnosis, number one. And number two, you do a thorough systemic assessment. <coughs> yes, and sir. in the list of invasion mentioned, you have mentioned the full list. You see, we don't do <laughs> routinely uh, sodium, potassium, uh, HB and AC for all patients. Yes, and sir. more so the coagulation profile also. And mm. in the history, you have mentioned a nice, given a chart of all the systems. Another mm. thing should be added in that list is uh, any history of coagulation disorder. You can ask the patient mm. whether it's got easy visibility, whether it's got increased bleeding, uh, any family history of hemophilia. So mm. if that history is positive, then mm. question of uh, coagulation profile comes. Because a, every, every investigation has to be rationalized. You just cannot write the full investigation for all patients. Patient for hernia, there is no reason for going for a liver function test unless he has something in the GI history that he has got some liver disease. So your clinical assessment, your clinical assessment underlying diagnosis will guide our uh, investigation. Okay, so it cannot be, so why do you do a sodium potassium in a patient has got gallstone disease? A patient having a biliary colic who does not have other um, uh, um, features like infections or any other uh, derangement, a routine sodium potassium is not desirable for a, any any young patient uh, who is for uh, surgery. Okay, no, sir. So, okay. Yes, and, and next thing is, uh, you have uh, given this diabetes. The most, mm -hmm. this is a very uh, a paid question in what round also. How do you optimize mm -hmm. a diabetic patient? Diabetic patient, you see, uh, he, there are patients who are controlled on diet. Some patient controlled on oral hypoglycemics, some patient are controlled on insulin. So you have mm. to keep in mind the type of surgery you are undertaking. If it's a minor surgery, no alteration is required. If it is major surgery, why a patient will be fasting for two, three, four days, maybe a whipple surgery. In that case, you need to convert the patient to oral hypoglycemic to insulin. And you should always keep in mind that it is not a tight sugar control. You can keep the blood sugar anywhere between 150 to 180 or 200. Okay, yes. Dr. Dash, uh, any, any comment from your side? He has presented very well. Very serious, sorry for being late. No. As uh, Professor Sahaj mentioned, your routine portion is not routine. Because, uh, uh, Professor Sahaj explained uh, nicely that uh, what we have mentioned, routine is not routine for all. 
as uh, Professor Saj mentioned, as per Quaglis and Dijard, you have to take the proper history. So how far you will go for this? There are a uh, lots of investigation regarding coagulation. So how far it will go? It depends on the history, and also mm -hmm. if there is any uh, on examination, you got some. So okay, sir. To be more specific. Yeah. Otherwise, and then, uh, there are a lot of other other diseases where need to optimize, like patient having renal failure. We often come across patient who are having renal failure on dialysis, uh, and this patient come for gallbladder surgery or some other uh, major surgery. In that mm -hmm. case, you have to optimize the patient. So, patient having chronic renal failure may undergo major surgery. In that mm -hmm. case, you have to do his basic parameters, electrolytes, potassium level, urea creatine level, and then mm -hmm. here the patient who might need perioperative dialysis. Yes, okay, sir. So, they are all specific mm -hmm. preparation for a particular underlying disease. You have yeah. presented most of the things, but these are the more important things that is there in the ward down scenario. Like diabetes, like uh, mm. coagulation disorders, like patient have you mentioned about anemia also. Okay, mm. so we pass on to the okay. next topic. Uh, so, next topic will be presented by Dr. Uh, Shakrajit. He's a junior resident at Howrah District Hospital. He will speak on anesthesia and pain relief in surgery. These are very all very pertinent topic for discussion. Shakrajit, you can share your screen. Yes, sir. Sir, my uh, screen is not unsupported, showing unsupported. Why? Uh, it is there with Milin, na? so Milin will share, you can start with it. You can see the screen? Yes, sir. You can see the screen, you can start, please. Uh, good morning, sir. I am Shokwin Vaiti from Howrah District Hospital, first year postgraduate training. My today my presenting topic anesthesia and pain relief. Anesthesia is a Greek word means without and mean without and anesthesia means no sensation. First uh, anesthesia given by Ithar uh, in 1846, done by William Morton in a case of vascular tumor surgery of Meg. Then is widely established by John Snow by using chloroform on Queen Victoria for decrease the labor pain. The key, key principle of anesthesia, the safe surgery achieved by close teamwork between surgeon, anesthetist and pre-provider care, pre-operative -pre care provider like nurse. Uh, safety checklist make sure that things are not too so bent. Who, uh, there is a safety checklist made by who which should be followed. Rick's assessment allowed that best strategy to be chosen to giving anesthesia and surgery. Anesthetists extending their care into pre and post-operative phase to decrease the morbidity. Uh, three types of anesthesia, general anesthesia, local and regional anesthesia. In general anesthesia, there is three types, total intervenous, total inhalation and balanced anesthesia. In local anesthesia, there is topical and infiltration type. And in regional anesthesia, there is epidural block, spinal block, intravenous, regional or bias block, peripheral nerve block, and ganglion or plexus block. Uh, there is three things should be achieved during general anesthesia. Amnesia, that is loss of awareness. Analgesia, that is pain relief, and then muscle relaxation. In general anesthesia, there is uh, inhalation anesthesia. Most common use, uh, previously used ether because it is irritant, unpleasant, and flammable. This rarely is now. Now, most common used isoflurane, sibuflurane, which are non toxic, stable, rapid, and faster recovery. Sibuflurane, for its pleasant order, it is mostly used in children and needle phobic adult patients. In intravenous anesthesia, most common, uh, most commonly used propofol due to its smooth induction, better hemodynamic stability, and auto burn, and in ability to use a continuous infusion. Hypertension sodium, it is rapid induction, but um, 
its adverse effect myocardial depression is decrease the blood pressure and give decremental effect it also reduce the metabolic rate and lower the intracranial pressure that is useful in neurosurgery uh, itomidet it uh, it is a good hemodynamic stable uh, and uh, intravenous anesthesia but it decrease the uh, adeno uh, it lowers uh, lowers the adeno cortical function uh, ketamine uh, ketamine is a uh, good respiratory it preserve the blood pressure and respiratory reflex <coughs> but it associated with the delirium after the uh, ketamine uh, intravenous ketamine monitoring the vitals during the uh, anesthesia is a major, major things uh, vascular by uh, measuring the vascular by electrocardiogram and blood pressure and then then the adequacy of ventilation inspired oxygen concentration measuring the inspired oxygen concentration oxygen saturation by pulse oximeter intraleptal carbon dioxide concentration we also measured urine output and the inhalers and anesthetic agent during the emergency major surgery uh, in special term uh, some special term anesthesia rapid uh, sequence induction is a technique that allows the airway to be rapidly secured it is used when there is a risk of regurgitation that may leads to pulmonary aspirations regional anesthesia there is neuro neuroaxial peripheral nerve block or plexus block epidural anesthesia spinal anesthesia there is five type of neuro regional anesthesia it is more effective when there is risk of mortality and morbid, when there is risk in general anesthesia like mortality uh, increased mortality and morbidity like obstetric cardiovascular and respiratory disease uh, it is it regional anesthesia decrease the need of analgesia there is a new transverse abdomen sprain block rapidly going a new technique it is given to the uh, triangle of petit it uh, to it uh, block the l6 to t1 no, t, uh, t6 to l1 uh, during the uh, abdominal wall the spinal anesthesia offers quick onset and short duration anesthesia epidural anesthesia also is more difficult than spinal anesthesia but it can be topped after post operative during pain management and continuous infusion local anesthesia two types uh, and topical and uh, and uh, and the uh, infiltration type most common used local anesthesia lignocaine uh, it is good sensory short acting and good sensory bug buvivacaine is cardiotoxic drug it is must be must not be used in intravenous prilocaine is less toxic but it cause methyl hemoglobinemia propifucan is less cardiotoxic greater sensory motor separation is more used most preferred than the liglocaine libo libovubican is isomer of the buvivacaine uh, in tropical anesthesia we also use the eutectic mixture of the uh, and local anesthesia like uh, liglocaine and prilocaine for the better, for in, in children and uh, we can also mofat reagent that morphine uh, in the uh, we can mofat in codeine in mofat reagent in which mixture of the adrenaline and the sodium bicarbonate in a local anesthesia in the ent surgery management the airway during anesthesia it is very much important during the general anesthesia uh, firstly we chin lift jaw thrust method suitable for the short term with no aid available goodell's airway hold the tongue forward but does not prevent the aspiration uh, supragotic device like uh, lma uh, easy to ins insertion reliable airway allows the ventilation endotracheal intubation the last uh, at, at the last endotracheal intubation which secured secure and protected airway during the general anesthesia muscle re relaxation during use me general anesthesia two type of muscle relaxants polarizing re polarizing and non polarizing uh, uh, saxamethorium is a polarizing reagent it's quick onset but it causes malignant hypertension hyper malignant hyperthermia so vancurium long acting mildly cardiovascular effect 
but it uh, it is should not be used in hepatic and renal impairment atracurian intermediate acting it's uh, regulated by non enzymatic hopman regulation but it adverse effects histamine release and allergic reaction so it is now used uh, cis atracurium is uh, decrease the it has decreased its histamine release and allergic reaction rocuridian rapid onset intermediate action a rapid reversible for uh, possible by sudamedox allergic reaction is decremental effect after the major part of the surgery uh, after the post operative period pain management it is unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual tissue damage with or potential tissue damage acute pain relatively short acting so relatively short duration and resolve with tissue healing or withdrawal or nox of stimuli resolve within minutes hours or days for acute pain we generally use insets uh, acetaminophen or other or uh, the tram uh, the tramadol like drug in chronic persist for, in chronic chronic pain that persist for at least one month beyond the usual course of acute disease or beyond a reasonable time in which an injury expected to heal for con uh, chronic pain management chronic pain uh, may occur due to malignancy pancreatitis or any benign pathology nociceptive Nos uh, pain uh, the different type three types of pain uh, chronic pain nociceptive pain uh, it is result for musculoskeletal disorder or cancer activating the cutaneous nociceptors continuous exaggerated response to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord Uh, neuropathic pain is due to dysfunction of peripheral central nerves is class is uh, typically burning shooting stabbing type uh, it's uh, example diabetic neuropathy trigeminal tri neuralgia it's uh, as a treatment of is we use gabapentin tricyclic inhibitor anticonvulsant drug uh, and cycle psych psych psychogenic pain associated with depressive illness chronic pain in benign disorder benign disease chronic pain uh, in this case chronic pain persists for the long more than 3 months uh, it is because of chronic pain that spontaneous firing of pain signal and in uh, nmda receptor in the ascending pathway due to post operative neuropathic pain not treated properly nerve injury sympathetic uh, neuropathy and phantom beep in case of the phantom beef if there is a previous the amputation the phantom is painful is after the amputation is phantom is uh, same pain stimulus is going to the uh, ascending pathway uh, as a treatment we can use local anesthesia and steroid injection nerve stimulation uh, trigeminal nerve stimulation acupuncture and dorsal column stimulation for the malignant disease chronic pain management uh, who who gives uh, three pain step ladder management okay for, and first step which use simple analgesic like paracetamol aspirin nsaid anti convulsant drug in next second step intermediate strength opioids like uh, codeine tramadol in third step we use strong opioids like morphine break through point in cancer patient uh, acute uh, in a controlled in a patient with controlled pain acute excruciating and incapacitating pain occurring spontaneously specific predictable unpredictable tear trigger uh, we use generally uh, firstly use in bolus dose of morphine for the treatment then gradually decrease with long acting uh, slowly dispersible morphine or fentanyl Uh, neurolytic technique in cancer patient subcostal uh, is new technique is uh, that that is subcostal phenol injection in rib metastasis uh, uh, celiac plexus neurolytic uh, celiac plexus neurolytic block with alcohol for the pain of the pancreatic and gastric and or hepatic cancer percutaneous anterolateral cordectomy the spinothalamic ascending pain pathway
that's all dr dash so dr maiti uh you have more elaborate regarding the advantages and <clears throat> disadvantages of uh, this uh, especially the regional blocks for the complication of spinal anesthesia you have mentioned some advantages advantages of epidural anesthesia and how we have to tackle it as for example spinal headache what are the measures we have to take to prevent the spinal headache and uh, hypotension regarding this uh, uh, during the spinal anesthesia we use caffeine or use the plenty of water for headache in spinal anesthesia but yeah, and if you have to use uh, the narrower bore needles if you uh, use narrow, yes, narrower bores then it is less chance of headaches now yes, they are sir. using using 27g and there is less chance of headache <laughs> and uh, similarly uh, hypotension is also very important factor during an immediate post operative period in case of spinal, spinal anesthesia yes, yes sir and during pain management uh, you must have mentioned the patient controlled analgesia especially in uh, post operative period this is more concerned with, uh, with surgical people how the patient controlled anesthesia helps and what are the drawbacks you must have mentioned there otherwise uh, yeah uh, and another thing is uh, you have not given uh, a little more about uh, post operative pain relief yes. you see that is a very important area and there is a concept now that is known as uh, why does the pain occurs because of surgery there is release of uh, some uh, uh, cytokines which goes and blocks the uh, pain receptors so there is a concept i do know, have you heard about the term called preemptive analgesia Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. What is that? Uh, it is the. Uh, I am not uh, properly known that. Okay, okay, okay. Preemptive analgesia is uh, you start the patient on some analgesic like NSAIDs before you give the insult. That means pre-op, you give a dose of diclofenac or acyclovenac, of, uh, like some NSAIDs. So this drug will block the pain receptor. So before mm-hmm. Uh, the pain receptor being stimulated by the pain producing substances you can block this receptor it is said that the relief of pain is better if you can give the patient pmt analgesia you will find often some anesthetic give diclofenac before you put incision so the other uh, this you can give a previous night also so this is pmt analgesia and then most important post op pain relief is you again again there is a ladder like that And, and in most cases we, we prefer uh, some narcotic analgesics if the patient is not elderly you, you can you can give the patient narcotic analgesics okay, okay. so post op analgesia is important so it's running short of time so i request dr uh, onindo to discuss on uh, day care surgery this is another topic which is come in the exam as a short note day care surgery just like that so what are the principles of day care surgery and how do you uh, there is a uh, a uh, good infrastructure is required for carrying out day care surgery is the pre op setup intraoperative post op discharge and then post discharge follow up all the things are covered in uh, day care surgery dr uh, anindo you can share your screen yes yes one second be brief morning, sir 10 10 minutes for you is the screen visible sir yes 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 you can go to slide show and start yes. yeah uh, i am presenting uh, our day care surgery i am dr anand bhopatra from regional hospital now the further definitions in ambulatory surgery now outpatient surgery with this um, patients are not admitted to a ward facility procedures room surgery surgery not requiring full sterile theater room and day or same day surgery with a discharge within 20 12 hours and overnight stay where Patient have to be admitted and stay for 23 hours or more and short stay surgery and admission up to 72 hours. Now, what are the components of day care surgery? The patient should be informed and fit for the procedure. It should be achievable as a day case. The procedure itself, it should be scheduled early on the operating list to allow early recovery and discharge. The home environment can support a post-operative ambulatory patient. Now, there are different models of care like office-based care, so diagnostic and ambulatory intervention are performed in consultation premises. 
it is generally done under local anesthesia. And standalone day surgery facilities where the procedures are performed in isolated facilities, free from emergency admissions, and is limited to local or regional anesthesia, and to avoid unplanned or overnight admission and the required transfer, bring, um, the patient to the parent hospital should be there. Now, self content integrated day surgery facilities where self content units have their own reception, ward, theater, recovery areas, and are functionally separate from the hospital. And integrated day and short stay surgery facilities, the availability of the overnight beds allow the center to embark on more challenging surgeries. Now, there are selection criteria for the patients. Like medical, there's no upper age limit. Physiological age is of more value. ASA 1 and 2 patients can be managed by standalone um, the centers, but ASA 3 requires hospital integrated centers. BMI up to 40 for surface procedures and 38 for laparoscopic procedures are acceptable and achievable in advanced units. Social adult care must be available for the first 24 hours, especially for elderly and patients at risk of cohort bleeding. Home conditions need to be suited. Surgical procedures which don't take more than two hours, minimal access surgeries are preferred. Adequate control of pain should be there and ability to eat and drink in reasonable time frame. Pre-operative assessment it should be done by anesthetist and specialized nursing team. Routine health screening should be done. Proper investigations should be made. Written and verbal consent by the patient should be obtained. Pre-operative assessment, scheduling, early scheduling of complex cases, local or regional anesthesia cases later in the day, optimal analgesia and anesthesia, multimodal analgesia with paracetamol and NSAID should be given pre-operatively. Long-acting local anesthetic infill of the surgical wound should be done. Careful dosing of inhalation and intravenous agents should be done to maintain anesthesia. And long acting opioids such as morphine should be avoided to reduce the incidence of sedation and post operative nausea and vomiting. Post operative complications reactionary hemorrhage after tonsillectomy or laparoscopic procedures is very common. Overt hemorrhage in laparoscopic surgery is very dangerous. Post operative nausea and vomiting is very common. <laughs> Complications should be monitored carefully and prompt management should be done. Ideal daycare surgeries. The, uh, in abdominal, you can go for uh, anal lesion, semi primary and recurrent inguinal or femoral hernia, laparoscopic cholecystectomy, laparoscopic fundoplication, pyramidal sinus surgery. For breast, you can go for excision biopsy of breast lesion, sentinel node excision. The genital urinary tract, you can go for laser prostatectomy, orthodectomy, circumcision, excision of hydrocele, varicocele, epididymis. You can go for several vascular procedures like varicose vent procedures, bragoscopic sympathectomy. And what are the discharge criteria? The vital signs should be stable for at least one hour. The correct orientation as to time, place, and portion. Adequate pain control with supply of oral analgesia. Patients should be able to take oral analgesia at home. The ability to duration walk where appropriate. Minimal nausea, vomiting, and dizziness should be there. The patient should be able to take oral fluids, and there should be minimal bleeding or wound drainage. And the patient should be able to pass urine before discharge. Thank you. Dr. Dash, any comment? Uh, uh, the it is, so we uh, do it in, uh, as uh, take care service many surgeries, but important is the post-operative care provider must be there. Ideally, there should be a post-operative care provider near home. Yeah. And with the continuous, there, is, uh, there should be communication. There should be uh, continuous communication with the uh, hospital team with the uh, local care provider and there must be facilities to take the patient to back and uh, so that there is ambulance yes yes that means there should be helpline you see the patient you are discharging for uh, you see the, your, your daycare surgery now more and more going towards our uh, conventional surgery like lab polycystectomy, lab appendectomy. Yeah. These are the patients who are now being discharged within 23 hours time. So you have to have a helpline so that any complication occurs, this patient can be taken back and adequately managed. And uh, what are the, you have given a long list of uh, discharge criteria, but there are basically three or four discharge criteria. A any patient who is in the hospital can leave the hospital when he is 
pain free number one when he is ambulant that means he can take care of himself yes. and he is not on iv fluid that means he is able to take the oral nutrition so these are the basic three criteria that patient can go home but always as dr darsha said that there should be a communication between the caregiver and the patient so that any emergency occur patient can come back to you okay so i think all the all the speaker has presented very well so these are the very basic uh, topics but they are all important for our day to day practice also okay yes, uh, i thank all the thank speakers you, thank, thank you sir thank you thank, thank you, you dr dash thank, uh, thank you thank you chat me care